Hello Hoobian and welcome back to the main channel. So, recently I released a documentary called John Comer, The Man Who Was Doctor Who. Which is a documentary all about John Pertwee. We filmed uh, in homage to the official Doctor Who documentary is created by the wonderful Chris Chapman. So it's Terence Chatted in Tibet and Terence and me are the inspirations. Now, this what you're about to see is the full version of the interview I did with Katie Manning. She's a wonderful person. Now, what's a few things I need to explain about this is A, it was filmed for the documentary so the YouTube greetings are not included. Two, this was, uh, there was a few issues with the Wi-Fi so she starts to cut out ever so slightly and freezes but you can still hear what she's saying. I didn't want to warn it with images or anything because that's what the documentary did, this would just be a regular interview for, as you can guess if you're listening or watching this, The Bully Box Files. So, sit back, relax, and hopefully enjoy Tom Mason interviewing Katie Manning! Enjoy! What well, was it like working with John Perry on the set, like, once the camera did, cameras had been turned off? Well, first of all, you know, the first time, I mean, we had sort of met because obviously once it was announced, I went over to his house and met the family and, you know, we hit it off like straight away. And then, of course, the filming we did, you do with no rehearsal. It's before you go into rehearsal and into the studio. So you do that first of all. And um, so meeting John... I was terribly nervous. I mean, I was very young and, it, you know, I'd done two other televisions, but I was, you know, fairly inexperienced, very excited. Um, and, you know, I was meeting Roger Delgado and Nicholas Courtney and, you know, it was, um, and all the others and, and uh, John Levine, and lovely Richard Franklin. So, you know, there was all these incredible seasoned actors that I was meeting. <laughs> um and I wanted to do the very best I could. There was only one little problem, which John said I knew straight away. But we, you know, when you just meet someone and you just immediately feel you have this incredible rapport, and we all did, and especially John and myself, it was just amazing. It was so, he was so kind and supportive, and we also had very much the same kind of sense of humour and he really kind of looked after me and nurtured me but there was a little problem I had and that was we were filming in the circus and I am so I was so back then you have to look at the era there I was so against animals and that I'm going to have a lion in the boot of my car by the end of this filming I did <laughs> and so but John and I just became such good friends he was Fine and funny and generous and you know I had this wonderful mentor in my life and the team just bonded so well straight away so that we became friends off screen as well which you know made a huge difference we'd all go to each other's houses for dinner and I went with John and his family to Ibiza um, so we became very very close friends all of us and and did was it was the atmosphere itself a fun atmosphere to work in as well? Yes, I mean you have to bear in mind, you know. Of course, you have fun. You know, people think acting is just fun. Acting is hard work, and it's long days. And as we were shooting, uh, not in the terrible ones, but in all the others, we were working in freezing cold temperatures. I'm in a mini skirt. I mean, there was one point where we were filming something. And my feet froze to the ground and I was supposed to run and my feet had frozen to the ground waiting to do the shot. So they had to get someone with some hot water to pour around so that I could actually get my feet out of the ice. Um, you work very, very far. It's, you know, we were on a low budget. You can't, you know, keep retaking and doing it again and retaking. You've got to go in there and you've got to focus and you've got to get that job done. But that doesn't mean, you know, that, that when you just stop for lunch or you have a moment while you're waiting while they do something, 
you don't have a, a conversation. John and I spend a lot of time, you know, because we travel to uh, rehearsals together every day. We try the, the locations where, so we we spend a lot of time with them. It, it's really, really important. It's hard work. And because you never, it was so important to John, which is the first sort of straight role that he played. And, you know, it's a huge role and he had to really find out how he was really going to make his doctor work, which of course he did brilliantly. Um, and, and I had to, my character uh, doesn't always happen in Doctor Who, but you probably, if you follow the series, you'll see that I was allowed to actually grow up during the series you know i went from this little person you know only a year out of school and having done a very short and almost useless time you know doing things like my character got to grow up right in front of your eyes which was wonderful as indeed i was growing up over that those, those years yeah and and when when you uh once you had finished working on on the once your tenure and his tenure it ended together. Did you still see him after, like long after you finished working with him? Well, um, yes, not as much because I um, went straight into two other televisions. I then uh, was doing a television during the day and the show at the Edinburgh Festival at night. Um, and then I spent three years in the West End. Um, so one saw a lot. You know, you obviously you don't see as much, but um, when you do see somebody again, and you're carrying on a conversation like you were only with them yesterday, that's what strong friendships are like. You know, I mean, I have friends that I don't see for years, but the moment we see each other, and I know I then left to go live in Australia after I had the twins, and John came over to Australia, and I came back here to do a show in the West End, and we met up a couple of times, but you know. When you're an actor, you're moving on all the time, changing, moving, so as was he. Um, but that friendship never, ever changes. Yeah. You know, the same with Richard Franklin and myself, you know, and John Levine. We are still strong friends. And anybody who was in the series back then, we've stayed very, very close friends without having to be each other all yeah. the time, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, and then what was it like coming, like after having so many years away from the show, then coming back? To do this show well it took me a long time to say yes um david richardson is very persuasive but he said i want you because i'd come back to i was living in australia and america for a lot of that time and so while all these things were going on i was completely out of that i was you know acting obviously and directing and doing written my own play and done all sorts of things um and David Richardson, we want you to play Joe. I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I can't play Joe without John. I, I couldn't even think of playing Joe without John. So for the first few years before we got the wonderful, glorious Tim Trelaw, um, I was doing John, the brig, the master, Joe. <laughs> I was doing them all. And at one point, we bought in Iris Wild Time to it all. Um, so... But it, it, it didn't dawn on me that I could possibly do this without John. I, I know, I, and I also, could I play Joe again all these, you know, years later? Um, but it was amazing when we started, you just sort of, you just start to fall into it. You know, the first one, I was finding my feet, but having to play all the characters and, you know, I wasn't going to try and do John's voice as such. Yeah. And that would be, you know, I do a lot of voices, but I just wanted to get the feeling, the heart, which... Tim, who I instantly got on with, <laughs> um, he's absolutely lovely. And um, he actually rescued me when I was locked in a toilet once when we were recording. So I knew then he was going to be my doctor. I got locked in and I sort of thought, well, they're all having lunch. So I'll just sort of stay here for a while so that I don't disturb their lunch. <laughs> they were all like, where's Katie? Where's Katie? And I sent the message and I said, um, Hello, I didn't want to disturb your lunch, but I'm locked in the toilet. And Tim came along and he took the shoulder and he went, wham, and he got that. I said, now you're my doctor. <laughs> but 
we had that wonderful rapport that John and I had. And I think that was very important. If I was going to work with somebody playing John, that there was that same closeness that John and I had and Tim and I had. It, he was marvellous. And it's not just the voice you have to find when you're doing that. I mean, I played Betty Davis um, in a show where I played nine people, including Betty Davis. And, you know, without wigs and without all those things, and this is audio, so you obviously you can't see him, but you have to find not just the voice. That's important to a certain extent. But the voice without the heart and the understanding of John as an actor and a person is never going to be the same. It's never going to work as well. You're just going to hear the voice. Yeah. But you want all of the feelings and the emotions and the affection that these two had for each other, which we did on and off screen, John and I. So Tim and I have found that, and he is absolutely marvellous. He's such a good actor. He understands how important to get that feeling, that heartbeat of John's. And in your opinion, do you think that the, all the big fish stories that they've done with you and John and you and like and, and the, the third Doctor, shall I say, do you reckon it still captures the magic of John's era? Do you reckon it feels like very similar to what it was? Um, yes, I mean, you're in a very different situation, but the writers that Big Finish um, have, uh, new ones coming up all the time, are excellent. But obviously, when you've created a character, whether I'm playing Joan of Grubb or Joe Jones, I play both. I go from like a 19-year-old to a 70-year-old uh, in different audiences. Um, it's, uh, the writing is so good, but there's always things that you can't expect a writer, especially some of them who are very young, to capture certain quirkinesses about the character. And Jo, jo was quite quirky. Yeah. You know, she was quite a mixture of things. She was very brave. She offered her life for the doctors. So obviously she was very passionate about the doctor. Um, she was brave um, and she was disobedient. You know, if you, if you said to Joe, don't do that, well, of course she was going to do it. Um, which, you know, always gave you that little element of danger. But she And she was funny and cheeky. And, to, you know, all those little things, you know in the way that she would respond. So you, they are so generous in letting you just pick those little moments of, if they miss them and you just slightly change the wording. But they are such wonderful writers. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what people want from that because I'm not this sort of massive fan of the these of doc, you know. Um, all I know is that we, every recording we ever do, we put our heart, our souls, and every ounce of our energy into, and we laugh. <laughs> yeah, because when you listen to them, you can you can sense that there's passion at the heart of things. Because in everything, there's always passion, but in these. There is a lot of passion into it, not just because of what it's made, it's just because it's the love that they put into it because they don't want to upset the fans. You want to make sure that they're happy. You want to make sure everyone's happy that it's... It, well, it but you think, you know, um, you know, the one thing, you know, John, you know, I learned from doing Doctor Who, and I've learned as an actress I would never do, you know, you always have to be 150% truthful. You never can send it up, I don't believe anyway. You know, it's like if you're playing fast, you don't play it for comedy, you play it for real. The comedy comes out of it. Yeah. But if you ever try to play something a certain way, it's, it's you know, the truth is the most important thing. And especially when you're dealing with things that don't exist. Yeah. I was doing things on... Um, what you call green screen now, which we used to call CSO, which was color separation overlay, which they were, it was new in my day. They were actually um, working on it with me, trying different, you know, blue and green and different things, you know, and you aren't seeing what you're working with. You, you've you got to be so focused on, in your imagination, seeing something that isn't there. Because if I can't see it, you can't see it, and on audio, even more so. If you can't 
hear our emotions and you can't see what we're seeing or feel what we're feeling, you won't enjoy them as much. And 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 going going back a little bit, but what what is your favourite memory of working with the John Pertwee? I think that's a question I'm afraid I get asked, and I don't have you know when you've had that incredible a time. There's no favourite memory. Every day, um, every moment of filming, driving to locations, all of the things we did together. You know, they all roll into one. I can't pick out. It's like, otherwise it seems like one thing never happened. That's the half time. And it was always the most wonderful. When our lives were, you know, I had a few couple of things happen to me before we went filming, which the fans don't really know about. I did actually reveal one of them eventually in Auburn. You know, we have a life and we're coming into work and you have to leave that life outside. You can't you can't go on with paint on your canvas. You know, you kind of have to go in with the, the blank canvas and go totally into that zone. Yeah. And so for me, the whole experience, the whole time, every act, every moment, just John picking me up outside you know, my flat every day because it was on the way to rehearsals. And sometimes he'd turn up on his motorbike and yeah. we'd go on the motorbike and they would be messing up other their acts. He would also rode motorbikes. So we'd be going up, you know, going to... Because the days then were much freer than a lot of things now. You know, you we, we were able to kind of... The, just, uh, you know, I never knew back then. Yeah. How could we know? John Burton even said public that, you know, when asked, you know, how long do you think the show will go on? He said, oh, well, probably after Tom, it'll be over. We had no idea except that we started to get where we went. We started to get fans. Now, I kind of grew up with some very famous people, so I knew what that was, but not for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I said to John, why are all those people there? He said, they're fans. I'm like, what? That's it. And, you know, and I'm signing order. And then he was teaching me how to do radio interviews. And, you know, it, it was amazing. Uh, but I never knew that my granddaughter would be running around with a figurine of me calling it grandma. <laughs> you know, at the age of six, suddenly I'm going, really? <laughs> um, you know, you know, people say, oh, did you save props? What for? Why would we, we knew, didn't know that one day people would be wanting to buy all the bits and pieces. Um, I did have the scripts because I keep scripts. That's the one okay. thing I keep. Because I move so much, I don't keep much of any. But they got all got destroyed in a flood. I think only, you know, a few years ago did I realize, my God, I was sitting on a little gold mine of memories there. But no longer, you know, stuff happens, life happens. But, you know, to now find that we're, that I've been in a show, that I have fans from Russia, from South America, you go to America, you go to a strip, it, uh, it, it's gobsmacking to me. And I love them so much. You know, every fan has a different connection to Doctor Who. Some of them had very difficult childhoods and it's, it changed their lives. Some people are inspired like Russell T Davis and you know um, Mark Gases and all of those wonderful people Gary Russell to actually go into a business and, and yeah. become writers or direct or even actors so it's it's an incredible show there's nothing else like it I'm very proud and so grateful to have been part of it yeah and when when like John had obviously when when the first series of John Zero had come out did he did he seem to enjoy, like, what, like, being the Doctor at that point? Did he, like, enjoy the character more than he did for the fans at all? Oh. John, because he, you know, John had done, you know, so much sort of um, light entertainment and cabaret and, you know, sort of carry-on type films. You know, he had this huge career in radio playing all these characters. And he just took the character of the Doctor and when he'd walk into a convention and the ape would go, you know. It 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 it, it, it he really 
was really how he kept that character so strongly at conventions and things. He, he was amazing. And also, you know, I learned a lot from him because he liked doing his own stunts. So I got to do a lot of my own too. And the habit people would train me in very quickly how to do something, um, you know, that I'd never done before. You know, I'd never tuck rolled out of a moving car, albeit very slowly in my life. Um, you know, uh, ab sailed down mountains, you know, all these incredible things that we got to do. And we shared those glorious times of learning how to do things. Yeah. And and do you, I don't, I don't know if you do, but do you have a favourite episode of your era that you... That... No. <laughs> Before you watch, no. Uh, I, those are, I don't favourite, you know, it's like, what's your favourite film? I'm quite aged, you know, how many films have I've seen? Um, but it's every single one of them has something that I have a loving memory of and enjoyed doing. I haven't watched anything that I did back then through since. So I haven't sat, I don't sit at home and watch myself in Dot Do, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, obviously when you're doing the, uh, you, 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 when you, we used to do with Barry Letts and Terence Dix, we used to do the commentaries. Yeah. Well, they could see the screen, but I couldn't because I didn't see very well. <laughs> but, you know, all the memories, the moment I see one tiny moment of it, all come flooding back. They've never left me. But no, I don't have a very... I think, if anything, I could say the terror of the autons because I thought that was quite extraordinary with the, you know, the policemen in their masks off and and, and, and the black plastic chair eating Harry Tal. I mean, that was scary stuff. Yeah. And working right the way through, I know fans love the, um, the demons and the sea devils, which we're doing at the um, BFI on some Saturday. Um, and, but I think the green death, because you see, I know this is just very quickly to say that back in about 1968, I became very aware of planetary problems yeah. of our problems. And, you know, back then people sort of look at you when you start to talk about things like that and say, Oh, she's just a bonkers hippie. Um, but for me, and so all that plastic stuff that was all beginning to come into my understanding of the problem we had and so when i did the green death it it was a very important one for me um and also when you think that he discovered that corn which we didn't discover till the 80s is made out of mushroom it's an alternative meat in the 70s he came up with those mushrooms being a way of feeding the world without meat so it was way before its time, but isn't it sad that it hasn't got any better? It got worse. Uh, and with with the conventions, which were weren't as was probably as big as they are now, but were becoming slightly bigger. What was it like being at a convention with John? I didn't do. I did, I did one. I was living overseas. I mean, all the conventions that were going on in America, I wasn't doing any of those. I wasn't doing the ones in England. I was living in Australia and you didn't have Doctor Who in the same way. Yes, they were Doctor Who fans, and you, but you'd get random episodes and things. It wasn't... Uh, and I was working all the time. I didn't even know those big conventions were happening. And then I started to get invitations to go. And the first one I did with... Um, I did with Terence Dix was like 17 cities in 17 days. And I only ever did one with John and it was absolutely wonderful in America. And then I did one here and there's, there's stuff on the internet, which, you know, with me and, and Nick and John, and you can see the love that was between all of us still there. But I, I came into conventions very late. Uh, and um, so now talking about the future, uh, is, is have you got any more uh, big finish audio dramas to, with uh, Tim coming up in the pipeline? Well, as you know, I've also just played an ice warrior queen. I mean, I don't just stop at Joe and Jones and Joe Grant. 
you know, I was in Dorian Gray. Um, I was in Dracula. I've been doing Irish World Time for 22 years um, and playing Joe Grant and Joe Jones. I did Torchwood um, as Joe Jones. It was called The Green Life. Um, and I also wrote my own play, which I performed twice in America with 25 characters, which is also recorded um, by Big Finish. So I don't just do that. Yeah. And um, I absolutely love it, whether I'm playing Joe Grant or Joe Jones. But, you know, I think it's quite nice to play, to have Joe Jones now. I think there's something rather lovely about this woman with 13 grandchildren, now great-grandchildren, seven children who's still going around trying to, you know, protect this universe. As she says, you know, we, Cliff and I went all over the world. We saw everything and we knew we just wanted to save it. And now Joe's life has gone right from that very young Joe Jones, you know, like 20 year old Joe Jones, right through to the fact that after 50 years, she, you know, her husband, which was very difficult for me because Stuart Bevan was my, we've known each other since 1972. We were engaged for about seven years. We, you know, we've never lost our friendship. So you can imagine, I used to go and spend weekends there. You can imagine how difficult it was when the real life character dies and I have to perform it because it was Joe's husband for 50 years. You know, because she talks about him a lot. I did a couple of the unit once with, um, uh, with Gemma Redgrave and so on. And, you know, there's always mention of Cliff. And and with with the latest box set, which is is incredible, which recently came up, I think it was just the other day, and I think it really was. I think it was the other week. I think I don't know the exact day, but but that was incredible because what was really good about that audio is that it merged together the 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 new Who of Sarah Jane Adventures and then Classic Who. What was it like when you first read the script for that? What for Sarah Jane? Oh no! For the new, for the brand new box set that just released, Return of Joe Jones. Oh, uh, well, we had to talk about you know obviously to work out how best to help me through the difficulties of having to discuss a character that is very real in my life and a character that's not real. You know, it, it, it's very difficult when you mess with real life and you know things like that. Um, so then we had conversations about it and did I, you know, how did I feel about even doing that? And I said, I think it would be the greatest honor that I could give to Stuart Bevan as an actor, um, because we're not going to be able to bring his character into anything. Yeah. I think we have to give him a wonderful and very loving farewell because you think that Joe and Cliff were together all those years. You know, she had two loves in her life, did Joe, the doctor, and Cliff. And, um, you know, I, I also liked the storylines and that you, once again, wonderful writers. We had the most fabulous actors um, and everybody was, you know, really good. Because Joe, you, she's changed, but I still have to keep some of the Joe that, you know, when you grow, you 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 grow up and you change and you, and so on, and you mature, but you don't lose the intrinsic aspect of who you are. Yeah, it, he's still kind of that Joe, but now with all this life behind her. Oh, and it was like you know, when I did Sarah Jane Adventures, you know, I said to Liz because I hadn't come back as Joe Jones at that point. And I said, I'm absolutely petrified because so the fans want to get in to want to see this this old granny <laughs> clocking around. <laughs> Took me about her 13 grandchildren. But so beautifully, Russell T, you could see bits of Joe, you know, from the clumsiness to the fact that she was such a loving human being, you know. Um, and so Liv has said, you know, she'd felt the same way. But I said, you know, you've been doing it. And she was so wonderful. And we'd been very good friends before. So she, you know, she was really supportive to me. The whole team were. And it 
it was the most extraordinary experience because it was the first to do that, yeah. you know, first companion to actually return 40 years later, other than Liz. Yeah. And and when when, when all this, when you would appear back in Sarah Jane Adventures and, and you ended all this, were you were you like sort of relieved once the fans had been really happy once you found out the fans were happy about all of this? Well, yeah, obviously, you know, when you've done something, um, it it's really nice because I'm deeply insecure, as I think most actors are. You know, you're never really sure. You've done everything. You've given everything you've got. You, but there's always little things you think, oh, I wish I'd done that, or I wish I'd done that, and. Um, you know, that's why I don't like watching myself very much because I can't change what I see. And then that becomes kind of, um, but what was so extraordinary was suddenly I'm getting on the bus in the tube and I've got all these school children going, oh my God, oh my God, oops. Oh, my battery's going. Um, and suddenly I've got these wonderful, you know, teenage fans because I've also got little tiny ones of five, six, seven. I'm now you know, got fans who've got children who've had children. And I bet how old I'm getting yeah. now. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm people giving, who say, I'm a grandpa now. Uh, I think, you know, you met my daughter and my daughter, it just goes on and on. And it's such a happy show because the number of people I meet when they, the families actually get together and they watch Doctor Who together. And I haven't missed one episode since um, Christopher Eccleston came out of the books. Oh, that's good. So, so to rest, so to round now. Okay. I cheered. I stood up and I cheered and I went, yes, the, you know, the two hearts, the one of the actor and the one of the doctor. It was an, and I, 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 I loved both him and, um, oh, I'm going to go blank on name. Who was, uh, oh, help me with the name. Who was the lovely, love? There's David Tennant. There's Matt Smith. No, I'm talking about Chris Eccleston. He started with um, Rose, with... oh, Billy Piper. Billy, brilliant Billy Piper, and I just loved it. And I went on, and I don't watch any of the the shorts. I don't, you know, when they show you, people say, "Oh, is this gonna?" I don't get. I just wait till it's on on a Saturday or a Sunday, whenever it's on, and I sit down on the sofa where it's meant to be watched oh, well, well. with and I jolly well wait till the next week for the next bit oh. because I love a cliffhanger. Oh that that's very nice. And so and to... every yeah. single actor that has ever played Doctor Who going right back to the footprints because we're the footprints that it wouldn't be if we hadn't. Um right back to William Hartnell, right the way through to the wonderful Jodie Whittaker, I think every single one of them has brought an incredible magic to Doctor Who, and I, it's just wonderful. I love it, and I feel so lucky. Yeah, and and so to to round off uh, this interview, uh, now recently uh, when you were announcing the most recent box set, you you were in an incredible. I'll say it again, incredible. Uh, like sort of like short before the trailer, which is all about baby sea devils, which a lot. Of oh, I want one. Yeah, people I want, want one as well. You, you don't I know what. I there's immediately. Yeah. And and so, what do you want to come back in your own spin-off series? Because everyone wants you now in your own spin-off series. Yeah, but I I think this is a little unrealistic. Now there will be spin-offs. I've been very lucky. I mean, if you look, I've got to have had the longest recorded life yeah. as a combatant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody else was brat children and that. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky that I've just grown up and grown up and grown up and still able to be the character having to, you know. <laughs> um, it is quite funny, though, when I am recording it, when I'm playing Joe. Grant, because I'm looking at Tim and I'm looking at lovely Davey, Daisy Ashford, who we went with, and I'm looking at John Blum and I'm thinking, I'm old enough to be all of your grannies. <laughs> and Grant, they're 19 and they're playing much older than me. So it's very cute. Um, but I, I never expect anything in life. 
um, I know there are people who say, oh, yeah, I want to do a spin-off. I, you know, if I was ever asked to go in just for, a, like, an episode where they needed Granny Joe and they needed Granny Joe's kind of love and knowledge of the planet, I would be so happy. But I think there are many more uh, that probably are of the right maybe older but the right age group you know i mean i don't know would you want to sit and watch granny joe running around the planet i would <laughs> i mean, I mean it, would, it would be it would be amazing but the, that shot was was perfect and i don't, I, don't, I think they'll miss, they'll miss something if they don't merchandise those mini sea devils because everyone wants one it's every time you look on the idea someone's saying i want one i want one they're all, they're all desperate for them it was it was also i mean it was freezing cold yeah. we did in a day um i'm used to freezing cold it doesn't bother me um but i did sort of little things like i had these little gloves on and they were actually children's gloves and i decided to go and just grab these gloves as she was going out and when you've got lots of kids and grandkids around you you know so that there were little things and then the jacket I wanted it to look like it was once my husband Cliff's and that she was wearing. And it was that one moment after I'd finished doing it as as the right way I felt for Joe. And Pete I is wonderful and he's a wonderful director. And I actually, well, after that shot, I just burst into floods of tears because I, you know, it wasn't right to do that at the shore but i held it back as joe would joe was like that she you know in the in the audio you know you can hear she's trying so hard to hold back um and i held back but the moment i'd done it it, it my little heart just and and also because i was thinking of, of don i'm thinking of my darling Stuart. i'm you know it it, it comes back to me you know yeah and and that's that's re that's really nice just to see that you've you've had this wonderful career within Doctor Who and you've enjoyed every step of the way as as what as one would say you've enjoyed every step of the way and as they always say the story uh, goes on and on um, and so thank you for doing this interview. Don't forget to subscribe to the official Tom Mason YouTube channel 